Okay, so this I have to send you the sample classes. I've not yet done that. I'll send you some sample classes, uh, audio and video, and I'll share you into a folder also. I will share you into the folder as students, uh, like one course which we have just com we have completed IPM, okay, which is the introductory course. So I will share you just like you have the lab student folder. I will share you with view rights into the IPM folder. Okay, this is just for your finance elective choice. If you want to select uh, whatever when you come to your elective decision, because I know that's a big decision that people have difficulty with. What subject should I take? The simple answer is you should select a subject which is interesting to you. That's all basically. And of course, uh, the typical the finance electives, the way they are taught actually is quite different from the FM1 and FM2. The FM1, FM2 tends to be more theoretical and based on textbooks. But this is a slightly different way of teaching. It's more like law. So you can get a flavor of that from uh, by navigating those IPM folders. So I would suggest that uh, you first navigate through those folders, go through the YouTube classes of finance and then you decide whether this is something that appeals to you if you find it interesting all that is required is that there should be interest okay you don't need to have very high levels of maths or anything like that but there should be without interest there's no point okay because if you are not interested in the subject then you are going to get completely bored because it is very complicated very dense and if you have more interest then you will just be completely switched off so you'll have a terrible time it's better to take a hr or a marketing or something like that which is not going to be that uh, complicated okay it's going to be it will require a lot of work even there but it won't be so complicated okay so let's go on to um, the part that i where i started rushing i started rushing here i think from uh, i want to just spend a little bit of time on this so this book we were talking about self improvement and observing your own thoughts okay and basically being alert to how your own thinking process might undermine your own outcomes what kind of outcomes you achieve in life they get undermined by the way you think okay so um, so i think it's a pretty important uh, point uh, to note here i'll just put it here as a big in caps okay this is a very uh, this is actually coming out of some i forget who actually said this but um, this is so important that uh, i thought i should we should write this down everything that happens to you reflects your mindset so this is a pretty uh, stunning kind of statement if you think about it but i think it's important to think about this i wish somebody had told me this when i i only came across this when i was in my 40s so when i wish somebody had told me this when i was like a teenager or something because it's quite a stunning statement and then eventually one day you realize it's actually true so i think it's very important to be aware of this okay so this book this book by epictetus i think is a very important book roman soldiers used to carry this book into battle okay it is almost kind of like the gita or something like that so and there are actually very a lot of similarities between the the message of the gita and this one so this is a, a and it's written in slightly old style but it's quite simple still so i think it's it's available for free i would encourage everyone to read it i think it's a very important book from a personal effectiveness point of view your whole approach to life and then if you want to spend money on the anthony robbins book uh, you can do that i think personally if you just do this that is sufficient uh, but this is a little bit extra on other stuff okay this is again uh, if you want to read this is more uh, the marcus uh, Anto uh, marcus aurelius antoninus uh, his uh, meditations this is quite a famous work in philosophy uh, this is also interesting but it's not so important the most important is to read this book by epictetus okay so uh, that's one here you can just read this article here So Kaizen, I've talked about. Okay, I just want to talk briefly about. You know what MOOCs are? You know what the full form of this is? The S is just for plural. Do you know what the full form of this is? No. Okay. Anybody here plays com uh, computer games? You play computer games. So what is MMORPG in computer games? Okay. So this is MMORPG stands for Massively Multiplayer Online Role Playing Games. You play some of those games, I guess. Okay, so uh, so this MOOCs abbreviation came from there. MOOC stands for Massively Online or Massive Online Open Courses. Okay, so it's massive because they have many students. Uh, online because it's online; it's not physical like we are here. And then open uh, massively on uh, massively uh, online open courses. Open because it's open to everybody, every everywhere, anywhere in the world. Okay, so I'll show you some portals. And it's and the courses obviously you understand these are courses okay so this is a spreadsheet that is there in your folder 
This is what I briefly discussed yesterday. So I think it's important to explain this a little bit, how you're going to go about it. This is just one of those websites, edX. This is a Harvard uh, MIT collaboration. It's actually run by an Indian professor. Uh, okay, so this, if you take edX, if you just take edX, I put the important ones in blue, uh, cyan actually. So mm, this is also important. Khan Academy is actually very good for maths and stats. The other subjects, I would not uh, take them seriously, but they're very good for maths and stats, okay? So if you want to brush up on your maths and stats, you can go here. And for edX, you can, let's just take edX as an example, what you're going to do. Uh, there's another link to edX in, in your notes itself, but let's go through the spreadsheet. spreadsheet. So remember here now, this is very important that you should not neglect your DSB work, okay? Take care of your basic coursework first. And this is over and above, okay? So this is because, you, you know, like it's a way of uh, sort of further uh, buttressing your CV, improving your CV. Because remember, the whole goal is that at placement, you should be able to score big. You should be able to blow away the company that placement, okay? So one of the things that, uh, I don't know why it's taking so long to open. Let's click here and see what happens. This is better. So, uh, so this, this basically the strategy here is that obviously you have to first take care of your DSB coursework, but then that is not enough. It's because it's a very competitive world. Okay. So uh, when you uh, over and above your DSB coursework, I've given you all the instructions on no domain knowledge, how you have to continuously monitor business news, all that stuff you're doing, but you're so young, you have so much energy, you can do all of this. Okay. If you're sufficiently systematic and disciplined, you can do all of this. Okay. So. Uh, this is the third part of it where you add the idea is eventually you're going to add some of these courses to your CV Okay, and uh, I'll just show you how you can do that. Let me just make this. Okay, all right, so you come here find courses. Let's go to find courses and I'll just give you an example as to how to proceed All right so you have courses on all kinds of stuff. You can search by subject. Okay. Uh, let's take uh, whatever course you want. Let's say you take a course on communication. Okay. Um, let's say you take this. This is Delft. Delft is a Dutch university. Okay. So you can take it's quite a, a well-known uh, university. This is technical university of Delft. It's in Holland. Okay. Um, this course is part of a certificate program, which is basically you do uh, a few of this. Uh, it's part of a series. So you do a few courses and you get a, like a series certification in communication, which means you've done five, six courses in communications. Okay. Now, uh, okay. Now you see here, it says free. Okay. And uh, so it says free and it says add a verified certificate for $125. Okay. So what I would recommend in general is that you don't need to waste your money. I mean, if you really want to waste your money, you can always do that. But uh, <laughs> if, uh, if you, you don't really need to waste your money uh, to get a certificate, all you need to do is you make sure that you do. So this is where you learn another term uh, when it comes to learning. Okay. We discussed yesterday about, uh, you know, uh, seminar style teaching versus uh, uh, lecture tutorial style etc so this is where you're learning more about the terms that are used in education okay one of these terms is auditing a course have you heard the expression auditing a course right okay so auditing a course means essentially you don't get a uh, official uh, certification for doing that course but you get to sit in the class and you can still learn you can learn as much as anybody else in the course it's just that you don't get an official stamp saying so and so attended this course. Okay, so the idea is that uh, your basic strategy here should be no need to go for a certificate. You go for the free part, which means you get to audit the course. So all the material that is there in the course will be provided to you. Okay, and you can go through the course. So what you really have to do is once you select a course, you make sure you do the course seriously, which means whatever material is there in the course, you should have mastered that material. Okay, it doesn't matter that you don't have a certificate. Once you've mastered the material, then you can put this course on your, I'll show you the formats also to do it. You will put this on your CV saying that I have done this addi these additional courses from edX, okay, or from uh, these MOOC portals. Uh, and you will put this course saying this course name from TU Delft, I've done it. The main thing is that you should be, once you put it on your CV, you must be confident that you've mastered the material in the course. Because if people ask you anything about the course, you should be able to answer confidently. And it will not matter that you don't have a certificate. You say that, you know, I didn't want to spend money on a certificate. 
because I mean at that time I didn't want to whatever I, I was not sure how much value there would be and all that so you can just give some excuse so uh, that it's not important to have a certificate uh, that it is sufficient this is a broad strategy that you have okay so I've just shown you one example of a course okay you register obviously you have to register and then there are some uh, dummy courses where basically there's a course teaching you about how to do the course on this platform okay so this is another important skill that you guys need to acquire because these platforms will be around for a long time now so in this modern age one of the things that students have to learn is also the, the, the reason I'm directing you to this is you also need to learn how to make use of these MOOC portals because in your career you will have to keep on upgrading your skills after let's say every two after three every three years or so in the industry you should think about okay now what can I do again to upgrade my skills okay maybe learn a new language or something like that whatever it is okay so this is going to be a part of your life so one of the things you need to learn is how to make use of these portals and how to do courses through these portals because that is also part of the learning initially when you're just there you don't even know how to proceed right so get familiar with this so this is an important part of your learning as well because modern day students must know how to make use of MOOCs okay these are there uh, for these things are there to stay all right so is this clear now you register okay then if you have a problem you can ask me uh, then you just register so you select your courses according to your uh, you know interest areas so you can see the course load and all is given to you four to five hours per week five weeks etc so make sure as I said again once again don't neglect your DSB uh, uh, coursework over and above okay and then we put it on the okay so is this clear now how are you gonna make use of this okay and then there are some other uh, resources that are put here you can actually explore them if you want okay so I'm going to just close this all right so uh, okay so skills etc so this is part of this whole Kaizen philosophy right every few months whenever you get some time you add another course you do a course and keep on you look at your whole, whole skill set as continuously improving your skill set continuously expanding your skill set so that is the whole idea okay all right so here uh, as this is already done so as I said just developing skills okay and and then the last part I said I already mentioned yesterday about coding okay everyone in the modern world needs to have some kind of familiarity with coding you don't have to become an expert but you should know what is involved you should know how to think like a programmer in a systematic way and Python is a good language to learn uh, so I've given you this course this is actually another one other of the uh, MOOC portals OCW stands for open courseware it's an MIT website where they make all the MIT courses available for free all the course material so if you go here they will direct you once again to the MOOC portal okay this is one of the famous courses of introductory yeah you can come but you won't get attendance okay so your choice whether you want to attend or not okay so this is a basic course now you see when you go to this course you can obviously get the lecture videos and all that stuff and then uh, here it says um, somewhere where I saw that yesterday or maybe uh, yeah you see this here so here you're going to the MIT OCW website okay which is hosted by MIT but they're also showing you that we are offering a free version of the subject on edX this is the other courses so you can go back to edX if you want okay so you can just explore this so it's a good thing so I would say once again just give it a shot and get a feel for what is involved in programming so that you get a few, that's an important thing if you are able to do it reasonably well again this is another thing that you can put on your uh, CV and then if you guys take IT as a specialization we are actually I think teaching all these uh, we are teaching Python also okay you have an introduction so you'll get some hands-on experience as well so it's a good idea to try and do this before you get to your um, second year if you want to take IT as a specialization before you get to that stage okay so that's another idea okay all right so here I think this finishes our uh, introductory unit zero uh, discussion now we can go on to okay now we start our uh, so this unit now you'll find that this is already in your uh, in your lecture notes okay in the lecture notes folder unit wise notes folder this unit one is already in your folder okay so you can study this on your own later on okay so we're just starting this particular unit the first unit this is now you might find this is a little bit theoretical and again as I said we discussed uh, Amadou just came in okay so um, uh, you might find this is a little bit theoretical and uh, you might get a little bit bored but sir, as I said to you yesterday 
uh, everything is not every type of material is not conducive to the case method okay so we should use the words uh, the method which is the most sufficient for that type of material okay so some of the theoretical material like what we are going to discuss in unit one is not conducive for interactive discussion because it's not efficient okay so therefore uh, you have to make an effort to engage okay whatever i'm teaching you obviously is stuff that you guys need to learn so you have to see it as this is something that i need to learn whether it's interactive or you know i'm not going to like have balloons and whistles and this and that to try and make it interesting for you uh, it, that's not going to happen so you have to make an effort to engage with the material okay all right so the first thing now here in jurisprudence and legal theory what we try to do this is again unusual in terms of what is taught in business school uh, lab courses in business school lab courses typically this kind of unit does not exist okay typically it goes straight into a textbook and typical uh, particular areas of the law like contracts etc but i put this in because i feel that this kind of basic theoretical grounding is important to understand how judgments because we are also studying it in a slightly different way we're going to study judgments so to understand judgments some of these things need to be understood okay so some of the concepts that we are so these are just concepts that uh, so you can look at this like the first concept that you need to learn, learn is the difference between normative and positive okay so these are just things that you have to internalize and understand the concept okay so there's a nice video here by this uh, yale professor uh, as you can actually see this on your on your own okay uh, and uh, you can also look at um, this just this in, uh, you got to read all this stuff okay uh, you got to read this and i'll just briefly tell you about this website okay so you have to read this i'll explain to you briefly so the way it works in class is that i will briefly explain to you the gist of these concepts okay and then you have the notes you study them on your own on your we have to go back and revise and then if you have any particular problems any part which you don't understand then you have to ask me okay then I'll, I'll explain it once again in the class okay yeah 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 you want to switch off this light yeah i just hope my can try come and try i just hope i i should be able to see my keyboard maybe i need a little uh, table lamp or something like that i last that is how to give me a table lamp yeah that's fine that's fine yeah i think this is better you should be able to see it i was also feeling that it was like it was too bright okay right so guys so the first point is normative versus positive for that you're going to listen to this video on youtube you're going to do that on your own this also you're going to read on your own i'll explain uh, the concept and let me just tell you briefly about this particular website okay positive versus normative here and then uh, before we get to this discussion let me just explain uh, about this website now you guys are learning economics okay you have some courses on economics i think you're doing me now this is the first economics course you're doing okay now in most economics textbooks uh, economics is taught as a very mathematical subject okay with a lot of calculus and stuff like that so the, i personally don't agree with that way of teaching economics because i don't think it's uh, it's appropriate and this is a very interesting website so if you but i think e economics is still an important subject you need to understand the basic principles of economics okay uh, so no matter whether i mean it doesn't matter whether you go into finance as a specialization or not so this is a, a very good website which deals with uh, economic uh, concepts in microeconomics and macroeconomics in a non mathematical way in a logical intuitive way okay so i think if you uh, if you want to learn this this is another way to learn economics so i would encourage everyone to make sure that you uh, of course first once again you take care of your coursework first but if you want to test your own knowledge of economics okay uh, you should just bookmark this website go there and look at the table of contents and then you can see uh, here all this you have micro and macro based uh, topics make sure you understand this is something that you need to have like a basic knowledge just like your accounting double entry bookkeeping etc these are things that you need to know as a graduating mba student okay so make sure that so this is a test for you make sure that you go through this website and you can understand all of the concepts uh, that are written here okay there's nothing no mathematics is used all logical intuitive explanations so you can bookmark this website from this particular link okay and so right now we are going to study normative versus positive here all right now okay so you can study this essentially so i'll just briefly explain to you what is positive versus normative positive as you can see here is this font big enough for you guys at the back okay so positive essentially is a statement about what is okay so i say that okay this building is uh, you know leed certified or okay this road is not paved 
etc so i'm making statements about what is okay about a state of affairs and whereas a normative statement is a statement about what should be okay like we should have a, a better grading system or we should have uh, you know uh, the police should not be so corrupt or whatever okay should be should not be etc okay these are kinds of statements so this is a difference between normative and positive broadly okay so you should be able to understand uh, the main the test that uh, that you have understood uh, these concepts is that you if you get a particular statement you should be able to identify that this statement is a positive statement uh, and otherwise you, if you get another statement this should be uh, you will ident identify it as a normative statement okay and, or sometimes you can even apply it to discussions some discussions or debates that you're having uh, those debates will be debates about positive issues or uh, is, is it a debate about a normative issue okay that is what you should be able to understand so it's pretty simple you just need to be aware of the uh, terms okay now um, look at the first question that we have okay so this is a very famous uh, sort of socio-political debate that is very it's a very hot topic in the United States this whole question of abortion okay so there you have two camps uh, it's important to understand all these aspects because the US is such a big and important country uh, it's useful to look at their uh, you know the, the the issues that prevail there so uh, pro-life is basically people who are uh, opposed to abortion okay so the if you look at the extreme versions of the uh, positions the extreme pro-life version is that uh, the extreme pro-life position is that life begins at conception which is what the pope says so life begins at conception so any form of abortion is uh, not acceptable okay so you have some extreme positions of uh, certain one judge actually uh, who was not nominated for a higher position he took the view that even a, a rape victim who becomes pregnant with the rapist child should not be allowed to have an abortion so that's an extreme position because that's based on this idea of uh the um that life begins at conception any form of so we are looking at the extreme positions just to understand the positions and then pro-choice again if you look at the extreme form of pro-choice means that even one day before the birth of the baby the woman should be have should have the right to have an abortion okay that's another uh, that, that's an extreme version of even one day why maybe even few hours before that she should have the right to have, have an abortion okay so that's the extreme version of the pro-choice position so that's called a pro-choice position with a the woman has the choice whether to have an abortion or not so this is a very very divisive issue in the us so it's important to be aware of these terms as well so now is this what do you think is this a normative debate or a positive debate normative is this clear this is a normative debate because it's basically essentially about what should be uh, you know what is what is the right thing to do etc now okay so let's understand a little bit about the second one obviously if the first one is normative the second one will be positive right <laughs> okay so now can you see what about this this debate between ajay and naina yes. what is happening yes. this is a positive debate why what is the question? yeah so what is the question is what is and another way to identify it is that this kind of debate can easily be settled okay if you see the part that i put in bold okay you can just go to google maps actually if you don't want to actually measure it you can just go to google maps and uh, solve this problem but the, obviously you have to understand this important point that this is a, a positive debate only if they agree on what a kilometer is now if i start saying no no according to me a kilometer is three miles then then you have a problem right so it's important to understand that this is a positive debate only if they agree on what is a kilometer okay a kilometer is 1000 meters if you really want to settle the debate there's actually a bar in paris there's a meter bar in paris it's a physical meter bar in paris which sh determines what is the length of one meter what is one meter and that's from there you get a kilometer which is a thousand meters okay so um, so therefore this is a positive debate only if you agree on what is a kilometer this is clear okay so the first distinction so one thing the one way you can use this um, what one way you can use this in your life is you'll notice that many times that the arguments that we get into in life are uh, usually you'll notice these are actually arguments about normative topics okay and uh, do you agree a lot of the discussions and debates that we have are arguments about normative topics and do you think that normative debates have any end no. there's no end because this 
uh, let's say look at this pro-life pro-choice debate there is no end because those who are pro-life usually are basically they, they are pro-life because of a religious mostly because of a religious not everybody but uh, most of the people who are pro-life are they pro-life because they are catholic okay so they are driven by their faith so that is obviously never going to change and those who are pro-choice that is also a strong policy position that's never going to change so one of the ways you can use this is that when you're having an argument you should try and detect whether this is an argument that is uh, is this a normative debate or is this a positive debate if it's a positive debate like how many things how many kilometers from here to there you can settle that debate but if it's a normative debate it's not worth uh, continuing the debate because it has no end you're just wasting your energy and you are uh, argue i mean anyway most of us like to argue so we argue <laughs> because you're arguing so so you should understand that uh, you are actually arguing only because you like to argue because this 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 debate has no end okay so this is one way you can use it in your uh, life uh, in a positive way okay uh, so okay so we're going to now look at when we are discussing normative versus positive uh, we're also going to look at a few other distinctions uh, which are quite similar to this normative positive distinction okay so you need to be aware of these terms uh, so a lot of this i've got some feedback from some of the other faculty members that uh, your batch is not you guys are not very comfortable with abstract concepts okay uh, uh, internalizing abstract concepts you have to get used to this because whatever maybe your undergraduate upbringing i mean maybe we are taught to memorize stuff and just you know uh, just rejuvenate on the out of sheet and get marks but now you have to start because you're going into a business program and so one of the important distinctions between an MBA and somebody who has not done an MBA is that you should have this comfort level with abstract concepts your theoretical grounding should be very strong and theoretical grounding requires comfort level with abstract concepts okay so you have to get used to it even if you're not familiar if it's a little difficult you have to keep pushing you have to keep pushing and make sure that you get comfortable with it okay there's no reason you can't because it's just a matter of effort because the human brain is naturally uh, sort of uh, is able to deal with abstract concepts okay so you just have to push yourself a little bit it's just happening because you're not used to it okay so you have to be conscious that you must be comfortable with abstract concepts with theory uh, with theoretical frameworks because that's one thing that makes a difference that marks the difference between an MBA and somebody who's not done an MBA okay because strictly speaking you don't need an MBA to do a uh, to run a business Bill Gates didn't have an it doesn't have an MBA neither does uh, Mark Zuckerberg okay and then who was the guy that Bill Gates took out from uh, there was a guy that Bill Gates pulled out of the Stanford Stanford is the number one MBA program in the world okay so this guy had entered into Stanford he was in the first year of his Stanford MBA and Bill Gates pulled him out when he was starting Microsoft telling him that you know come and start this company with me who was the guy Paul Allen no not Paul Allen because okay you're right at least you know about Paul Allen he just passed away actually so the other the guy is Steve Ballmer Steve Ballmer is the CEO of Microsoft until recently before uh, Satya Nadella took over okay so Steve Ballmer is basically a marketing guy but he was in a first year of uh, just imagine that being in the Stanford is such a difficult MBA program to get into and so this guy is the first year of Stanford and he pulls out to start a company which obviously when you start Microsoft you don't know what's going to happen okay it might be a, might end up being a failure but the guy goes out and starts Microsoft so neither uh, Obama doesn't have an MBA Gates doesn't have an MBA is a face Zuckerberg doesn't have an MBA okay Sheryl Sandberg has an MBA from Harvard Business School but she's telling you that MBAs are not required in tech okay so you don't need an MBA to run a business but but since you've got into an MBA program okay it has have some value one of the things that people will expect from an MBA student is the ability to talk intelligently about business concepts, management concepts, and be able to apply theoretical frameworks. These are things that are, and have good communication skills. Okay, so these are expected from MBA students. Okay, so make sure you make an effort to understand these uh, types of uh, frame. I mean, these frameworks and these concepts. Okay, so the other description uh, you can read on your own. Okay, uh, the other description: normative versus positive. Okay, it is very similar to the distinction between what we call descriptive and prescriptive. Okay, which one do you think is uh, so? When I'm saying that these two distinctions are similar, that means you can match, uh, you know, descriptive to either normative or positive and prescriptive also. Okay, so which one do you think is uh, uh, out of descriptive and prescriptive? Which one do you think matches to normative? Prescriptive. prescriptive okay because prescriptive like the doctor tells gives you a prescription so he's telling you you have to take this medicine after dinner okay 
so th this is what you should do okay so prescriptive is the same as you can read up the definitions on your own okay so prescriptive is the same as this is a descriptive and this is okay i haven't clicked on prescriptive but you can click on prescriptive and see what it says why is there so much noise outside normally whenever there's noise we blame the first years so <laughs> okay so um, so prescriptive here again so you can see that prescriptive the definition that is given of prescriptive is the same as normative it's similar to normative okay and that's one of the things i follow in my teaching is that when i'm teaching people some distinctions i bring up all the other similar similar distinctions so it's easier for you to remember them i think it makes it easier for you to remember them okay so uh, prescriptive is basically the same as uh, normative okay telling people what to do how things should be and descriptive is just uh, something that describes uh, reality okay now remember one thing here that is important okay that a positive statement need not be true okay i think it's kind of obvious but i just want to make the point okay need not be true okay just has to be i just want to hammer home this point it just has to be uh, sort of um, verifiable or another term that is important falsifiable okay you understand this so if i make a statement that say roger federer is less than six feet tall is this a positive statement or a normative statement? Positive. The positive statement, but it's actually not true because he's actually more than six feet tall. But the point is that a positive statement does not have to be true. It just has to be something that can be verified or falsified. Okay, it has to be in that nature. So when I make a specific statement like this, you can obviously test it. Okay, you can test it. A statement that can be objectively tested and verified to be true or falsified. Is this clear? So a positive statement need not be true okay all right so here there's actually this falsifiability is also an important point i think i'm going to just add this here um, yeah, we, we may come back to it so just save time um, because there is a link here so okay so descriptive versus prescriptive okay um, and then the other distinction distinction is here that is morality or ethics versus legality okay there's another distinction again which is similar to normative versus positive okay that is uh, you understand what is meant by morality uh, you say that something is immoral something is unethical okay and then there's a distinction between what is legal and what is uh, you know uh, uh, mo uh, what is legal or illegal and versus what is moral or amoral okay or immoral okay so that is again once again can you see that it's very similar to normative versus positive okay especially the morality and the ethics part i may say that certain things if you are selling somebody something if you are maybe suppressing some information okay you're selling something to somebody it may not actually be legal because the law may not have provided for it but it might be considered unethical okay because you are deceiving that person okay so uh, so in that sense again if you are saying that something is immoral it's kind of what is it similar to positive or normative normative right so you're saying that you should not behave in this particular way okay and legality is well not so similar to po being a, a positive statement but once again it's kind of similar because it's written down in the law and the law says that you know this is what uh, it's a little bit outside the law so that's similar to the positive element of it okay so here the statement that i've made here to understand you're familiar with set theory from uh, from uh, school okay so set theory is uh, we can close this also yes okay so um, you understand what are the elements in a set so if i take uh, the set of all students in section a then each one of you is an element of that set okay so the set of all elements uh, and then of course in set theory we have this concept of uh, the null set you remember what is a null set it has no elements okay so so for theoretical uh, clarity you must be clear that in every set a null set is a member of every set is an element of every set okay so we would say that set of all students in section a is basically all of you individually as elements plus the null set which is a set with no students okay theoretically that is what we need for um, 
uh, to be correct about the elements of a set. Okay, so what we are saying is the set of all immoral acts, okay, is likely to have more elements than the set of all illegal acts. Okay, you understand the statement? Does the statement make sense? That everything is, that is forbidden by law, okay, generally, uh, that's why I put a little qualifier, is likely to have. I haven't said is. If I put in a thing like likely to have means I've kind of protected myself, I've made a slightly hedged statement. Okay, so if somebody, uh, you know, contradicts what I say, I say, okay, I, all I said was it's likely to have. I didn't say it always has. Okay, so uh, do you understand what is being said here? Just to test your understanding of set theory, just to refresh that a little bit also. Uh, that generally whatever is made forbidden, whatever is forbidden by the law is forbidden because society considers it to be immoral. Okay, so like murder is forbidden by law, so obviously murder is also considered to be immoral. Okay, theft is also considered to be immoral, it is forbidden by law. So generally you'll find that most of the things that are forbidden by law are, are forbidden because uh, society considers it to be immoral. Okay, but everything that is immoral need not be for forbidden by law. Okay, I think most of you are not in agreement with what I'm saying from, from the response that I'm getting. Are you getting uh, what? Do you agree with... Uh, the response is not, people are not convinced about what I'm saying. Statement is not clear. No, what I'm trying to say is that the reason I make this statement, okay, uh, that the set of all immoral acts, okay, so let's say that there are 20 acts which are considered immoral by society, okay, but out of which only 15 have been outlawed explicitly according to the penal code. Let's say we are talking about criminal offenses. Let's say there are 20 types of offenses which are considered immoral by society, but only 15 because when you come to legality, legality is based on what is actually written down in the law. Okay, in the modern societies, you can only prosecute people for what is actually written down in the law. All right. So therefore, uh, out of those 20 uh, offenses which are considered immoral by society, they may have actually made only 15 of them illegal according to the penal code. Right. So if you are talking about any of those five offenses which have not been made illegal, they may still be of, they may still be immoral, but you can't punish people for them because they are not been they have not been made illegal by law. Is this clear? Is it a little clearer now? Okay, that's what I'm saying. Essentially, that everything that is so this kind of distinction you have to get comfortable with because when we come into contract law and every other aspect of the law, this is that's why it's very related to set theory. Set theory is a very important branch of maths which helps you a lot in logic also. So um, this, uh, the idea here is that everything that has been made illegal, now again, not 100% true all the time, but generally it is true that everything that has been made illegal by the law, okay, explicitly <coughs> forbidden by the law, okay, like murder, theft, okay, a robbery, okay, all these things. Uh, if they have been forbidden by the law, it is, it is because that they have been so forbidden because society considers those actions to be immoral or unethical okay that is something that people should not do that's why they have been forbidden by the law okay but everything that society considers to be immoral need not have been forbidden by law okay you might have certain types of actions which we all consider immoral which we'll see once again we are just going to see an example of that okay which may not have been made illegal by society so therefore you can't punish people for it you can say it's unethical because a lot of the things that happen for instance like mis-selling, okay, you might have heard this in, in the case of some of people you know. A lot of uh, these uh, salespeople in, in banks and insurance companies, this happened a lot with the ULIP plans, the unit linked insurance plans. A lot of people were sold these because they have very high commissions, okay. So these guys have a huge incentive, the salespeople have a huge incentive to sell these plans. So they sell these plans, the unit linked insurance plans, to people who don't understand the product properly. Okay, a lot of people, senior citizens, retirees and all, they don't understand the product properly. They just sell it to them somehow by just telling them whatever they want, need to tell them to sell the product. And they sell it and so then these guys are sitting on losses, even though the stock market has gone up, but these guys are still sitting on losses on ULIP plans. Okay, uh, these, these uh, ULIP investments. Okay, so this you could say this is unethical or this is immoral because these salesmen have actually in some way, uh, you know, like, you know that story from the Mahabharata, right? The Ashut Mama when Dronacharya's son Ashatthama, they wanted to give him the impression that his son had been killed but actually it was an elephant that had been killed right so then under his breath he said that but that's an elephant okay so Ashatthama is dead 
so that that obviously is not ethical right remember so that's why what happened was what happened to yudhishthir after that you know the story no okay so the point is that because dronacharya so let's discuss a little mythology it's very interesting okay so because dronacharya could not be defeated okay so they had to find a way to kill him they could not kill him even arjun could not kill him so they basically had to find a way to get him to lay down his arms so they got judish so they got somebody to tell him that your son ashutthama is dead in battle so because yonacharya didn't want to be sure and so he asked the only person who would never tell a lie that is yudhishthir okay so yash yes, yudhishthir is ashutthama dead and yudhishthir said yes ashutthama is dead but then under his breath softly he said but it's the elephant it was an elephant called ashutthama who was dead okay but his son ashutthama was not dead so that's why he said first he said yes ashutthama is dead but it's the elephant under his breath so the elephant part dronacharya didn't hear so when he heard that his son was dead he you know out of dejection he laid down his arms and that's when arjun shot an arrow and killed him okay so after this because yudhishthir had never told a lie before so after the, and that's why yudhishthir's chariot used to always ride about 4 inches above it never used to touch the ground so that's after this incident his chariot came down to the ground and it used to always run on the ground this is what happened to him after the uh, this particular incident and that's why he had to actually when they all went to heaven right that's why yudhishthir never went to hell all the others went to hell for a while but uh, yudhishthir had to actually do a conducted tour of hell and see all his brothers uh, and draupadi suffering because and why did i have to do this they mentioned this incident that you had told this lie right so anyway this is fascinating stuff so mythology uh, is is just fun to discuss okay but anyway you learned a little bit about our mythology right okay guys so is this point clear or now yes sir that morality versus legality generally whatever is illegal is considered immoral okay but everything that is considered immoral may not have been forbidden by society explicitly and we see an example of this okay and this will also help us to read uh learn how to get to know how to read statutes although this is a penal statute and we are only concerned with business law but the statutes are written in the same way okay this also happened with the case of paisa scam when they distributed a lot of credit cards to the people mm -hmm. which were thought to be a profit but eventually it came up a loss because people left their houses ran out by taking the credit cards and the company had to face a lot of losses because of that Okay, I'm not familiar with this particular incident, but yeah, all these cases of unethical behavior, which you would all consider unethical behavior, but you can uh, you can't always punish people for it because in our modern societies you can only punish people for explicit breaches of the law. That's why it's so difficult to get a lot of people who you know clearly are criminals, but you can't really get them because you have to get them on a particular violation of a section. Okay, so let's look at a particular section now. which this section has actually recently been overturned by the supreme court you might have heard of this rule of judgment okay but we'll study it anyway because it's a complicated uh, kind of section and it will get you familiar with uh, this idea of morality versus legality okay so let's read this section which is 497 of the ipc so remember very recent uh, judgment has actually um, okay so let's read this judgment and let's try to see this is how normally judgments are written okay now you read this judgment now i'll ask then after that i'll ask you some questions Okay, so read this judgment. Uh, sorry, not the judgment, but the section. This is 497 of the Indian Penal Code. This the Indian Penal Code is one of the most voluminous and comprehensive penal codes in the in the whole world. It was written by a guy, a Britisher called uh, Charles Macaulay. Okay, it's a huge uh, piece of legislation. You can already see it's got over 500, I think 530 or so sections. <coughs> so read this. Then we'll discuss some questions. It done. We have. We you don't have to memorize it because we have the text on the other page also. Because then we'll go on to the other page where we're going to look at the uh, the uh, text in a slightly different way. Is this clear? How you read it? We read it. Okay. Now most legislation is written like this. They don't really take a great deal of care with respect to punctuation marks. Okay. Punctuation is very important in written English. Okay. You especially people use uh, underutilized commas 
okay and dashes and all that they don't really break up sentences very badly written but look at this uh, we try to break it up a little bit in a slightly uh, you know uh, so it make, makes it easier to read this font is big enough still at the back okay all right okay so uh, maybe i can make this 130 here it'll be good if you can still see it yeah i think it's a little better maybe i can make it 135 okay this is even better okay so now let's read this 497 now you see what i've done i've broken up the section okay and the part which deals to with the punishment i've just made it very small because we are not really concerned with the punishment but there is we should be aware that this term also exists maybe we'll just make it back into the same font size so that okay so there is a part that deals with punishment also so now you see how i've broken it up this is how you have to read sections okay because one of the things one of the messages of this particular course is going to be that you have to be very comfortable you should not be treating the law as something that okay is done only by lawyers okay because the quality of legal education in india is very poor so it's very likely that you are if you have to actually deal with a legal problem you might find a lawyer who doesn't know much about the law so you are going to use this course to get completely immersed in the law and you should be comfortable reading judgments you should be comfortable reading statutes so that if you have to god forbid ever deal with the litigation with litigation in your own life you should take charge of the litigation you should read the section on your own okay and make sure you understand the section make sure you understand the case laws that are being used you have to manage the litigation you can't rely on the lawyers okay so that's one of the things hopefully that you're able to at least you'll get comfortable with the idea okay so the first thing you have to know is how to break up the sections when you're reading it okay so you see how i've broken this up okay into different parts okay and so the punishment if you're not concerned with the punishment you can just you know separate that out okay and then you see the last part okay so now you've read the section i can put that there now let's go through the questions okay say say tom and jane are married okay we have to make another assumption okay since we are going to use the word affair okay now let's deal with the questions question number one is tom guilty no, no. he's not guilty why because Chitra is single okay so but now now let's come to this question now let's come back to this question now so under the indian penal code tom despite being married he can have an affair with Chitra and it will not be uh, punishable under the law. Okay, so it's not illegal. But is it immoral? Yes. Yes. Is it immoral because he's breaking the marriage vows because the vows of fidelity are on both sides. Okay, are reciprocal. So here you can see one example of what is meant by what is the distinction between morality and legality. Okay, now of course it's uh, this whole section has been struck down. Okay, but we are just discussing it because it's a very recent uh, striking down of the section but it's still worthwhile to discuss where we had this law on the books for many years and in the past when it was challenged it was not allowed uh, the challenge was not allowed okay so you can see here in the first case that this is the difference between morality and uh, legality okay his actions would still be immoral unethical but it would not be they would not be illegal okay he could not be punished okay now second 2.1 is rajan guilty yeah. Yeah, he's guilty. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we have we have Rajan. Okay. Uh, so we have Rajan here. Okay, so Rajan is guilty. Okay, so let's send him to jail. All right. So uh, uh, now he's guilty because why? Because Jane is married. Because Jane is married. Okay. Now if you look at 2.1b, what if he had the consent of Tom? He's not guilty. He's not guilty. Okay, because what does the law say here he is only guilty if he is doing it without the consent or connivance of that man okay yeah why rajan is guilty i mean is this a two way process i mean maybe jane was also equally no you're saying that jane was also uh, so sort of she also she initiated the affair since they both have an affair. Yeah, so Jane was also a willing participant is what you're saying. Yeah, I'm assuming both. Both are willing. Okay, we come to that now. We'll come to that a little bit later. But I think here you have to also understand. Here we are asking from a legal point of view. Most of these questions are from a legal point of view and sometimes I'm asking you from a moral point of view. 
but i think you are talking more from a moral point of view at this stage you are talking more from a moral point of view and that's why we are trying to see we are trying to use the section to understand the difference in morality and legality okay that everything that is immoral need not be illegal okay so we'll come to that you'll see the answer to your question uh, for the moment you have an idea that okay you probably are mixing up morality and legality okay so at a time you can't mix up both obviously the first approach has to be on the legal grounds you can only prosecute people in modern societies in the modern western societies uh, we are also a western style society because our legal system comes from england so uh, uh, in these kinds of societies these modern western style liberal democracies okay like india us uk canada you can only prosecute people for explicit violations of the law you can't just say okay i don't like the color of your tie let's put him in jail okay so uh, that's that you can do in certain other countries okay but here you can't so uh, so is rajan guilty under law he is guilty because he has had an affair with a woman who is married okay this is clear that's why he is being caught under that provision now b is what if rajan had the consent in that case it's not okay now again here you can once again bring in the element of morality do you think that if just because it has he has tom's consent is that legal or i mean is that moral or ethical no, okay it is not moral or ethical but it does not seem moral or ethical to most people but it is legal okay so once again you can see the distinction between morality and ethics on the one side and what is legal or illegal on the other side okay all right now then the second 2.2 okay now this is coming to your question okay if you see the answer to your question was already in the last part of the section the last part of the section which i've broken up again as a separate uh, component which is that in such case that is all cases which are deemed to be cases of adultery the wife shall not be punishable as an abettor you know what an abettor is an abettor is somebody who encourages some encourages somebody to commit a crime okay so if i tell somebody like you know go beat up that person and then they go and beat up that person that not only the guy who beats up the person will be well, not only will he be punished but i will also be punished because i have abetted him to commit the uh, commit the offense abetting means encouraging a person to do something and usually it's used in the context of illegal actions okay so you have uh, that's why you have this thing called abetment to suicide that's so in many of the cases where uh, a wife commits suicide the husband is charged with like what is happening in the case of sashi tharoor okay so the i think there may be some other sections also but i think one of the obvious uh, cases is if she is doing because we don't even know for sure whether she is like that's a case of suicide or murder that also that's also not clear but if it's a case of suicide then he could be charged for abetment to suicide that means he must have made her life so miserable that it drove her to suicide so that's an offense under the indian penal code abetment to suicide so that means you are essentially pushing the person to do something which is illegal okay in this case uh so so uh, so a better means someone who encourages the actor to commit the offense okay does not himself commit the offense but he encourages them to commit the offense okay all right so uh, in this case it says in such case the wife so in all cases of adultery the wife shall not be punishable as an a better okay so it's a blanket provision which means whether the wife uh, you obviously your statement is correct because if they had an affair okay and then as it says here that such sexual intercourse not amounting to the offense of rape so there's no allegation of rape they had an affair that means it must have been consensual okay so the wife is also a willing participant <coughs> but it clearly says here in a blanket provision the wife shall not be punishable as in a better okay so essentially here so that's why what you're saying morally ethically it's correct but legally it's not correct because the law has given the an escape clause there the wife shall not be punishable as an abettor so the law has made men are always right sorry the law has made men are always yeah you could say that but now this provision has been struck down by the supreme court very recently okay it's been i'll give you the link also where the judgment is discussed but very recently it has been struck down as being unequal you can already see here that it's unequal because the husband was allowed to cheat on his wife and there would be no punishment as long as his lover was not married okay but the wife was not allowed to cheat on the husband uh with uh, with another person okay uh, because the other person her wife's lover would be punished but the husband's lover would not be punished so there is asymmetric treatment of the sexes okay so this is happening because they actually very old this is a british uh, era law okay obviously penal code comes it's written by the british uh, so uh, this obviously was written in those days but now in england also this is not an offense in most of the modern western countries 
adultery is a private wrong it's not a public wrong okay so we are not the penal code it should not even be in the penal code because uh, penal code is concerned with things that cause consternation to people around you know general public okay you go around you know destroying property a gang of people is going around destroying everybody's property that's a public offense so that's why we punish those kind of things adultery is really between the husband and the wife it's not really concerning it doesn't concern anybody else so anyway so this has been struck down but the point is to understand here to see the section to see how sections are worded because every section whether it's civil law or criminal law will be worded like this okay so you get comfortable with the wording of sections and you learn how to break up the sections when you read the sections, you have to break it up to make it, uh, you know, more uh, sort of intelligible because they don't use proper punctuation. And then to understand also the difference between legality and morality. And so when you're discussing like what he was doing, that when you're discussing something, when you're looking at something, you have to, you should not confuse legality and uh, morality. You have to look at them separately. Okay. You can obviously look at the moral questions, but uh, you have to see strictly speaking, what can actually be punished under the law that part also you should be very clear about okay all right so this obviously you can see here what is happening is uh, here this this is a very old law so it flows from this concept of woman as a property of man so that's why there's the element of consent okay so if you if i catch you using my tablet well, my laptop i didn't give you any permission then i can actually uh, you know say that you're doing something wrong but if i gave you permission to use my laptop then i can no longer say anything because i gave you permission so it's just basically the idea that because in the olden days the idea was that woman was the property of the man, which is what the Supreme Court has now said that this is not the way to treat uh, in this modern age. We can't have this kind of law. So they have struck it down. OK, so you can understand why these kinds of provisions come up. OK. All right. So this is the case that you guys can read uh, if you want to. OK, this is the case that came before the Supreme Court. This is 1985. I think if this case is very old. Yeah, 1985. So this is actually very interesting and it's uh, when you look at this, the, the uh, opinions of judges, if you're familiar with some of the judges of the Supreme Court. Okay, so this particular here, the author is this uh, Justice Chandrachur. He actually, uh, this is the case, Somitri Vishnu was a lady and she, while her divorce proceedings were going on, but the divorce was not final. So she had an affair with someone. So the husband prosecuted that uh, the wife's lover under this section. Okay. So then the wife brought this case saying that this is a, you know, this violates Article 14. Article 14 is an equality provision in our constitution. Okay. So it violates Article 14. And that's why you see she is the petitioner. Okay. She came with this petition before the Supreme Court. But actually this Justice Chandrachur, he shot down that uh, appeal. He shot down that petition. And he said that, no, we are not going to just interfere. This is the right law. This is the correct law. And all. so this happened in 1985. So this recent Supreme Court ruling where they have struck down this provision that actually reverses this kind of decision. Okay, so you can see 1985, they were not willing to strike down 497 of IPC, which was obviously, it was obviously unequal even then. Okay, they, I mean, they, I don't know why they came up with this kind of decision in 1985. Maybe the brains were not well developed in 1985. But you can see clearly here that they, in this particular case, they actually shot down the uh, petition and they did not uh, overrule they did not sort of uh, annul that section so this woman so you understood this case okay Somitru Vishnu versus Somitri Vishnu versus uh, Union of India where this woman basically because her lover was being prosecuted by four, under 497 she came to the Supreme Court and said that for the same petition which came this time and which succeeded but in 1985 it failed okay uh, so the same petition failed in 1985 which is against uh, an attack on 497 of IPC now the interesting thing is this Justice Chandrasur uh, 1985 who shot down this petition but among the judges who actually actually shot down uh, the 497 so allowed this kind of petition in, in, in uh, 2018 uh, his son Dhananjay Chandrasur is on that bench okay so he's on that he's on the team of judges who have actually shot down this thing and his dad in 1985 did not allow the same petition exactly same petition and there's no logic actually if you read this decision it's really a crazy decision but uh, uh, it doesn't have any there's no logic to it because it was clearly wrong even in 1985 but anyway so this is the second decision where and there was another decision there's a very famous decision we'll discuss earlier uh, later on uh, where the same thing has happened that uh, justice chandrashur his father had uh, ruled in a particular way but the son dhananjay chandrashur has ruled uh, in the opposite way uh, in this modern age okay so this is one example we can come back okay now one thing see one thing here we're going to use this to 
learn about something else when you're reading because you're going to be comfortable with reading judgments you're going to have to be comfortable reading judgments and reading statutes so one thing you have to be familiar with is uh, these are called cause titles okay this this part is called a cause title that is this part somatri vishnu versus union of india this is called a cause cause title so you notice here that the person who so with the term that is used here is petitioner and respondent okay so when we say petitioner on one side on the other side is the respondent okay so these are terms that we use so on the one side you would have maybe i can highlight this verses so that you can see the split clearly okay so on the one side you have applicant or petitioner or appellant or plaintiff or prosecution okay on the one side so applicant would typically go against um, opposite party so they have worded it this way so when it's applicant on one side the other side would be opposite party okay so applicant happens when you go to places like quasi judicial forums like the rent control tribunal etc okay those places you would use the term application okay so you have an application to the rent controller okay you know that we have the delhi rent control act okay in every every state in india it's all based on the same kind of legis the same format you go to the delhi rent control act you go to the west bengal premises tenancy act or you go to madras rent control act all the the provisions are very similar because it's based on the same legislation uh, same model legislation so you can have applicant versus opposite party you can have petitioner versus respondent as you can see in this case you have petitioner versus respondent okay or you can have appellant appellant is person again who is um, uh, appealing the case okay the whole person who is appealing is a is an appeal uh, appellant okay so appellant and again will be matched with respondent okay and then you have this is what happens in civil cases you have plaintiff and on the opposite side is defendant okay and in the criminal cases you have prosecution okay which is the prosecution versus the accused okay so whenever somebody is accused of a crime so you'll have the prosecution will run uh, conduct the prosecution against the accused okay so you will have so in india the criminal cases are all mostly run by there are some exceptions they're mostly run by the state okay so if there's a crime if somebody is being uh, you know uh, prosecuted for a crime in say pitampura maybe he robbed a house in pitampura or something so that's it will be state of delhi versus uh, so and so okay a uh, state of delhi versus the accused okay that will be the uh, the citation uh, the cause title so is this clear so when you say so the way it works is the person who brings the case is uh, mentioned first okay so in this case since it's a supreme court case so you can actually figure out certain things which will be useful when you are starting to do your judgments okay in the later part of the course which is you see here this is a supreme court case and uh, it says petitioner somitri vishnu that means that somitri vishnu must have lost in the high court okay so you come to the supreme court after you uh, certain cases you can come directly but generally you come after losing an appeal in the high court so uh, that means that she must have lost in the high court and so therefore she has initiated the motion at the supreme court so whoever initiates the motion is mentioned first okay so you'll have this mentioned first so if she's mentioned first me so from this you can understand a few things that she's basically she must have lost in the high court okay that's why she's brought this thing to the supreme court and that's why her name is mentioned first okay so from who the name that is mentioned first you can see who must have lost in the lower court Sir, okay. if yeah. the case is turned down in the state court and the high court it is not allowed to go to the supreme court so no no where did you sorry. where did you see that no 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 it might be see there is something called a special leave petition okay so normally what happens is the so that uh, you have to go first through the district court if you are a normal case okay you go through the district court and there are various levels of jurisdiction there is a junior judge and senior judge and all that depending on the amount concerned so then you go through district court and then to the high court and then if you lose in the high court you can actually ask the high court to give you a certificate for appeal okay so if the high court feels that there is a question of law involved okay then they will say okay in this question of law you have, we give you the permission to appeal to the supreme court so if the high court does not give you that permission you can still go under what is called the slp route which is the special leave petition so under special you can still uh, the high court has refused permission to you to appeal but you can still go under the special leave petition to the supreme court and then ask them to consider this petition so you can still do that okay and so uh, okay all right so here you can see i've given you a link to another mooc okay 
this is a, again this is not a very high priority MOOC if you are interested in this particular topic you can do it but it's interesting because it has considers all kinds of philosophical moral issues so there is a course there's a MOOC from Harvard called justice the link here is working I just checked it so uh, you can do this MOOC also again if you want it's another MOOC that you want to do depending on your areas of interest okay so continuing with these distinctions okay with uh, between um, uh, the uh, similar to positive versus normative okay uh, those kind of distinctions we are going to distinguish once again between these two terms positivism formalism versus again this is again it might seem very the theoretical but the, the idea is quite simple so just make sure you understand it here okay so you have realism you can just take out the legal as a common term outside the brackets and then you have realism or instrumentalism okay on the one side and you have uh, positivism or formalism on the one side okay these are not exactly the same but these two are very similar positivism and formalism are very similar realism and instrumentalism are very similar okay and then the distinction between the two is again very similar to normative versus positive okay so here you can see essentially what happened in legal positivism is this is actually a movement that started in England okay there's a guy called John Austin who is associated with that essentially what was happening is there was at that time in England okay there was uh, in this time like uh, this when he was like in the mid 19th centuries early mid 19th centuries there was a lot of talk about you know people were looking at the law and basically looking at legal provisions and saying kind of like what you were saying that uh, no no this is not moral this is not ethical this is uh, you know this should not be allowed okay so they were actually trying to mix up the the morality and the ethics of questions with uh, what actually the law was providing for so they were actually going to the extent of saying that certain legal provisions are not acceptable because they are not moral okay other they are not ethical so certain legal provisions they wanted to ignore and certain things they wanted to enforce even though they were not written down in the law because they felt that this was uh, you know immoral or unethical okay so this is actually a, re a reaction basically uh, this I don't know if I've written that here um, it's actually a reaction to this kind of uh, mood that prevailed in England at that time okay so this was known as natural law I can just write this down here briefly um, reaction to what is called natural law um, legal theory okay so here what they were saying is that the natural law the law given by God this is not more this particular legal provision is not or not correct okay so the it, John Austin wanted to basically complain about that kind of thinking he was trying to say that don't mix up legality and morality on the one side with what uh, uh, don't mix up uh, legality and morality okay so he was trying to say that focus on what is legal okay what is legal is what the law according to the process that you know you go through parliament you go through parliament and then the parliament decides that certain thing is a law then the queen gives a sign assent to the law so that makes something a law now whether when something is a law then we are not going to be talking about whether the law is moral or immoral it doesn't matter what matters is that this is the law of the land so whatever the law has been whatever law has been laid down that is the law uh, that is what is legal uh, legal and, and, and break violations of that are illegal so don't worry about what don't bring into this the discussion of what is moral or immoral or mo uh, moral or un uh, immoral or unethical so this is essentially what it was so legal positivism essentially it comes from the word positive you have you heard this word it's a little bit unusual maybe you're not heard about this okay so it's like positing means I say something okay I like I posit that the earth is flat okay that means that positing means I'm putting forward a, uh, a proposition okay I posit that the earth is flat okay so that's that's how the word is used so positivism comes from that that you know the basically the the legislature uh, with the assent of the Queen has basically said that this is the law the law has been written down this way and so then there are no more questions uh, permitted on whether this law is moral or immoral whether you think it's moral or immoral you still have to follow this law so that's essentially what it was saying okay so again this is this seems similar similar to normative or positive positive right because it is actually making you look at what is the law it is not concerned with whether you consider this law to be proper or improper or illegal 
you are not concerned with whether this should be the law. Your, you may have an opinion that this should not be the law, but that is not relevant. What legal positivism was essentially saying is <coughs> that your opinion about the morality or ethical <coughs> characteristics of a particular law is not relevant. What is relevant is whether this law was properly enacted, went through parliament, got the assent of the queen, so that now it's a law. Okay, and that's it. So you essentially this was a movement against this uh, prevailing uh, natural law theories that were uh, sort of you know corrupting the atmosphere in England at that time according to Austin and he wanted to bring back the focus of society to what the written law says okay so this is essentially what positivism is all about okay legal positivism and it's very uh, so, so you can see here that it is very similar to what is meant what we say is you know it is positive rather than normative he was trying to focus people on positive rather than normative okay and so something that is very similar to legal positivism is the idea of legal formalism okay formalism is again again a movement or a judicial philosophy okay in uh, which is important to understand in the law so legal formalism again is the same thing it basically if you follow legal formalism okay you are someone who believes that the law should be interpreted as it is written okay so whatever the law says you should follow that we'll give you an example very soon and you cannot go outside the law even if you think that that should be done even if you think that whatever the law is saying is immoral or unethical okay even if you think that breaking the law would actually not following the written law not following the written law would be the moral thing to do or the ethical thing to do you still cannot do it because you are bound by what the written law says is this clear this is the philosophy this is a judicial philosophy and we'll see it very soon in this example okay um, here you can see the theoretical explanation of this okay So they should not, judges should not apply their minds on what is in the interest of society or what is the public opinion or this and that. They are only concerned to concerned with interpreting the law in a mechanical way. Whatever the law says, you interpret that in the mechanical way and then you pronounce judgment. Okay, so it's a judicial philosophy. It's very important to understand the difference between formalism and what we'll see is the opposite of this. Okay, and that is uh, realism or instrumentalism. Okay. You can see here that it differs from form, uh, realism. Before we understand realism, let's just briefly look at uh, this example. Um, okay, you remember here what happened in the uh, Nirbhaya case? Yes. That there was this uh, juvenile who was also convicted. Okay, and then there was this debate about the release of the juvenile. Okay, so this there, this is the article about the changes in the juvenile law, but I'll just highlight the other one. But you remember there was a case when the Supreme Court refused because under the juvenile law, after a period, he was supposed to be released right and there was a huge uh, public outcry about this because people did not think that he should have been released because they thought he was guilty equally guilty right so i think the public opinion was overwhelmingly uh, in favor of uh, not releasing the juvenile right public opinion was overwhelmingly in favor of not releasing the juvenile but you read what the supreme court says um, here so first here you can see the supreme court this is basically uh, whatever December 22 okay 2015 so this they refuse to stay the release okay so refuse to stay the release means the release was allowed okay they refuse to stay the release so what is the Supreme Court saying here now look at the second paragraph you can read the second paragraph so this is a classic example of what is meant by legal formalism that the Supreme Court can see and I'm sure maybe even the judges themselves personally felt that the guy should not have been released and they were very clear it was very clear to everyone that public opinion was overwhelmingly in favor of not releasing him but what the Supreme Court does is here they are following this judicial philosophy of what is called legal formalism they are following the letter of the law and they're saying that the law makes it very clear that the juvenile cannot be detained beyond three years is this clear okay so this is a classic example of uh, legal formalism so this is very important to understand because you will see that many of the decisions are being are being made in a particular way because certain judges subscribe to certain types of philosophies okay mostly this is pretty unusual actually in India because uh, you get a lot of the opposite type of rulings in India now because judges are bringing their own social views into it 
but in the early days in India when we had uh, the 1950s and uh, you know mid 50s or so mid 50s late 50s we had some very very uh, nice you guys have heard about Mohammad Hidayatullah okay he was actually a vice president also uh, but he was one of the greatest judges of uh, India he, he his rulings if you read Hidayatullah's rulings uh, if it, you can do this if you want to improve your understanding of the law and also the English the English is very good you can just go and read up uh, look at Hidayatullah's judgments okay are we that's that's your alarm that's your online alarm so that I don't detain you okay guys we can stop this now let me first stop the alarm where is the alarm <laughs> okay all right this is meant to ensure that i don't detain you beyond that exact time and we don't have to track okay guys so what we'll do is so you understood legal formalism we will continue